over 20,000 signatures. <laughs> and the amount of signatures is rising exponentially every day. Uh, we're going to have, by the time this is done, we're going to have uh, at least 90,000, more than double what we need. I want to thank all of you who are working in our ballot drive. Thank you all very, very much. I just talked to a, um, to a, a reporter from Paris, Map, from Paris Match, which is uh, you know, the biggest um, magazine in Paris. And he, he, was, he had read my book, American Values, and he was comparing this campaign to my father's campaign. And he said there are many things in common and he reminded me in that book, I talk about the fact that when my father announced, I didn't believe that he could possibly win, and he didn't either. He was running against a Democratic president of his own party. He was running against a war that many people were still popular with most of the American public. He was running against all the institutions of the Democratic Party, the people who had supported him when he ran his brother's campaign eight years before. He had all the Democratic mayors on his side in 60, and they were all against him in 68, including Mayor Daley, who had played a key role in 1960, and who was where the convention was going to be held in Chicago. He had almost all the labor unions against him, which had all been with him in 60. He had the only unions who were with him in 68 were the United Auto Workers and the United Farm Workers, which was Cesar Chavez's group. He had, he had, he had all the big, he had all the liberal press against him, from the New York Times, the Village Voice, all of them. The liberal, <laughs> the liberal Democratic clubs were all against him. And, um, and then I remember in March when President Johnson dropped out of the race, and I, I realized, oh, he's going to win this. And, um, you know, there have been so many things along the line, so many people who have said we could not get to where we are today, that we would never get crowds like this anywhere, and we couldn't do the fundraising, we couldn't get ballot access, and everything that they've told us we can't do, we've done. And, and thank you. And um, the the, the uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. But the, you know, people have said, people say, one of the things the press keeps saying to me is, well, you're trailing in the polls. And there's no way that you can you that you can catch up with President Trump or President Biden. But I look at the poll that Fox released this week, and I'm leading President Trump and President Biden in terms of favorability. Yeah. Which, and and if you taught 80 percent of the American people say they do not want to have to vote between President Trump and President Biden. So the question, and, and by the way, in, we're not, the press won't do these polls, but we do them all the time, where I run against President Biden, and when, I, when it's a head-to-head -head just me against President Biden, I beat him in a landslide. <laughs> and when I run President Trump, just me against President Trump, head-to-head, -head, I beat him. And President Biden can't be to him. So, so then why am I behind? The reason I'm behind is be in the voting polls, the conventional voting polls, is because so many Americans are voting out of fear. 
and if you, you know, I, I have yet to talk to anybody outside of my family who, who says we're voting for President Biden because he's energetic and because he's got, he's got the cognitive capacity to outsmart everybody in the world and he's going to give us a new vision for America. They never say that, except, again, except some of my family members who, <laughs> who do believe that. What they say to you real, normally is, you got to vote for him or Trump's going to get in there and destroy the republic. And all of the messaging from the President Biden, the New York Times reported, President Biden is, is going to have $3 billion to spend on this campaign. But he's not using that money to amplify his voice, to talk about his record, to talk about his plans for the future, to talk about his vision, his promise for our country and the American people. He's not using it to talk about how he can solve the debt problem, how he can solve the chronic disease issue, how he can wind down the forever wars. You'll never hear that from this campaign. The only thing, they, their only strategy is to try to keep me off the ballot and then to make everybody terrified of Donald Trump. And on the other side, they do the same thing. <laughs> on the other side, they do the same thing. They're saying, you have to vote for Donald Trump or President Biden is going to get in and it's going to be the end of the republic. So... My challenge, and this is what I tell the press when they say, what is your path to victory? I say my path to victory is to convince Americans not to vote out of fear. But, <laughs> if, if I can persuade the American public to vote out of hope, to vote out of a faith in their future, to vote after a, a, a vision for this country that they can be proud of, that they can believe in, that they can, that they can feel like their children are going to be safe, their children are going to have lives, their children are going to get into homes. If I can convince them of that, the American people, then I win the election easily. Oh. Oh, so Franklin Roosevelt, who was the, one of the greatest figures in the Democratic Party history, in 1932, he said to the American people, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And the reason he said that is because he saw what was happening in Europe at that time. The Great Depression had leveled the United States economy. It was, it, it, Europe was staggering. And he saw the rise of demagogues all over the world, and they were using fear to get people, citizens of those democracies, to abandon their values and to vote, to give up their rights and to vote for somebody that they otherwise didn't want to vote for. And he saw the power of fear and how damaging it was for democracy. And that's something we need to, to remember today. And when somebody is telling you, vote out of fear, they are trying to manipulate you into abandoning your values. <laughs> are any of you guys gonna vote out of fear during this upcoming election? <laughs> and, and they, you know, I, Bill Maher asked me the other night, I was on there a couple of nights ago and he said, he, he asked me about the difference between President Trump and President Biden and I said to them, if you look at their personalities, their dispositions, their presentation, their ideology, their approach to life, their interactions with other people, there's huge, huge difference. They could not be more different. But if you look at the issues that they actually differ on, it's a very tiny Overton window, and it's mainly the culture war issue, the very predictable issues, abortion, guns, the border security, uh, transgender rights, 
these issues that really are used to divide us all, and the issues that are really existential for our country, the issues that matter to you and your children, you know, the chronic disease, they never talk about that. They're not, they're not talking, and these are issues that, these should be the centerpiece of every debate. How are we gonna solve the debt issue? You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to solve the debt issue. Some people say, well, you could, should spend the money on infrastructure because you, you can't really cut your way out of debt. You have, to, you have to build a new economy and new opportunities to make the economy bigger and the debt proportionally lower. Other people say you cut your way out of the debt. These are really interesting debates. They're debates that wouldn't you like to hear politicians <laughs> talking about this? Do you think anybody in the press corps is ever gonna ask them those issues? No. Oh, but these are the most important issues to the people of our country. This is the, you know, the only way our children are gonna survive and have the same opportunity for, to enjoy communities that give them the, 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 the opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, is if our politicians start being asked about these questions and forced to answer them, and hopefully debate them in a way that's respectful and congenial to each other and to all of us, so we can hear their answers. What I would say to you is that I don't believe that President Trump or President Biden has any capacity to deal with these issues. And, I, and I'm gonna tell you why. The debt now is $34 trillion. We spend more just servicing that debt than for our military budget. Within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that is collected in taxes is gonna go to servicing the debt. In the last 100 days, we added another trillion dollars. Within 10 years, 100% of every tax dollar collected is gonna to go to servicing the debt. There's gonna be nothing left for anything else. Do you think that's sustainable? Aren't you, don't you wonder why none of these politicians are talking about this issue? Yeah. Oh, the, the, the reason they're not talking about it is because they're the ones who did it to us. <laughs> President Trump ran up $8 trillion in four years on his four-year watch. $8 trillion. That was more money spent than every president from George Washington to George Bush. 283 years, and President Trump spent more on his watch. And then President Biden came after him, and in his four years, he's racing to beat Donald Trump. So how can either of these presidents come before us and say, I'm gonna solve the debt problem? Because they had their time to solve it, and they did the opposite of that. Another crisis that's existential for us is the polarization. And every, all of us worry about this, don't we? Yeah. The hatred that Americans now voice toward each other, the fact that all of us have family members that you know, we have difficult talking to now yeah. because, because of that, the, 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 the anger and the poison, the toxicity, the vitriol the acrimony in our political system that is drummed up by the political leaders themselves and then amplified by the press. It, and it's not sustainable, and it's amplified also in this era by social media algorithms that work to polarize us because those algorithms which are self-governing have discovered that the way to keep eyeballs on the site, which is the way to make, they make money, is by, by fortifying our worldview. So if you're a Republican and you live across the street from a Democrat and you ask the same question of Google, 
you'll get two different answers. You'll get answers that fortify what you already believe. So we all get forced further and further apart. And you know and I know there is no good ending to this unless somebody, an adult, steps into the middle. Steps between all these people and says, wait a minute, let's start talking to each other like human beings again. Let's start respecting people who we disagree with. Let's stop hating on our family members because they don't have, want the same political candidate as, as us. Let's, let's be. <laughs> and, and, but President Trump and President Biden have no capacity to do that. How many of you think that if either President Trump or President Biden gets elected, that everybody's going to stop hating on each other? <laughs> How many of you think the opposite's going to happen? <laughs> exactly. Half the country is going to be angry, and half the country is going to be smug. And we need, a, we need a different outcome. We need all Americans to get together and say, you know, let's go on, let's make an adventure. Let's take a risk on our future. Let's take a risk of being kind to a neighbor with whom we disagree, of talking to them in ways, in tones, and words of respect. And let's see if we can do something different. President Trump can't do that because he feeds on the vitriol. President Biden can't do that either because he's feeding on the hatred and the acrimony. And they're using that to get people to vote against the other guy rather than for them. And so they, this is another issue that is existential for our country and they don't have any capacity to deal with. The, the chronic disease epidemic. They, when my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60%. What? So, <laughs> is this the first time you've ever listened to me? <laughs> Somebody get her a, a cell phone with it and show her how to work the videos on it. Uh, and it, it, is the, it is the biggest expense that we have. $4.3 trillion we're spending. When my uncle was president, 6% of the GDP went to health care. Today, it's about 18 or 19%. It's 22% of our budget. And m almost all of that is going for chronic disease. It's five times our military budget. It's unsustainable, and it's growing every year. And the Republicans and Democrats, the only thing they argue about when you talk about health care is who's going to pay for it. Is it Obamacare? Is it going to be you know, the uh, public-private um, options? Is it going to be the, the HMOs who pay? Is it going to be you or is it going to be the corporations? Who's going to pay for it? And it's like moving deck chairs around at the Titanic. The ship is sinking. And it's sinking because we're getting sicker and sicker. We're the sickest people on earth. Our kids are the, are the sickest generation in the history of mankind. And you know what we had? There was a reporter who asked me yesterday, was I going to pull the, the, the uh, uh, recall the Moderna vaccine? And here's the answer to that question. We had the highest death rate during COVID of any nation in the world. So we are the sickest people in the world. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. We only have 4.2% of the world's population. Whatever we're doing, whatever we did, it was wrong. And I, I, I'm not going to point to a single thing that was wrong because there were, there were a lot of things that were wrong. Locking down the American public was wrong. 
Shut it. Shutting all of our businesses was wrong. Mandating, telling you that you cannot, you are, are going to lose your job unless you submit to an unwanted medical intervention. <laughs> that was wrong. Ba banning us. <laughs> banning us. Banning us from accessing therapeutic products that our doctor recommended. That was wrong. So, do you think if there's another pandemic that President Trump or President Biden are going to be able to give us something different? It was President Trump and President Biden who gave us all those interventions. And I'm going to say this about President Trump. To, to his credit, President Trump said publicly that he thought it was wrong to lock down the public. He thought it was wrong to mandate medical products. He thought it was wrong to not give the American public access to therapeutic products that their doctor believed would be good for their individual health. But then, when push came to shove, President Trump caved into his bureaucrats. He gave to them. So what I would say to that is that, that if you want more of the same, you should vote for President Trump or President Biden. Do you want more of the same? Don't you want something different? Don't you want, don't you want somebody who's actually going to look at the science, who's going to read it, who's going to question the technocrats himself? Let me ask you. <laughs> don't, don't, don't try to, her son's trying to quiet her, quiet her down. <laughs> don't let him do that. <laughs> oh, let me, let's talk about AI. How many of you are scared about what AI might do to our country? And. And how many of you are optimistic that AI could bring something really wonderful to our country? Exactly. It has a tremendous promise to cure disease, to make our lives better, but it also has a peril to enslave us, to alter our reality, to allow the intelligence agencies, the corporations to manipulate us by activating these neuronal uh, uh, charges in our brain that, that, have been, that have hardwired in us, and it can do all those things. Elon Musk said, first it's going to steal our jobs, then it's going to kill us. And he's the guy, one of the guys who's invented it. We should be listening to him, shouldn't we? Do you, how much sleep, how many hours of sleep do you think that President Biden and President Trump have lost worrying about my, what AI might do to our country. <laughs> Zero, exactly. <laughs> Don't you want a president who's thinking about those things? Uh, I mean, the issue is, is complicated. We can't just regulate it away. You can't do that, but also, we want to make sure that the hub of it the, that is here in our country and that it's used to build new industries, new economic activity. We don't want to drive it to China. We don't want to drive it to Iran. We don't want to drive it to Europe, so we need to embrace it. Uh, we need to make sure that it's not going to kill us. And, it, and in order to do that, we need a president who's willing to step outside of these old hostilities and talk to President Putin, and talk to President Xi, and talk to Iran and Israel and all of these other places. We, 
we can't afford to be a nation of war anymore because all of humanity is going to be lost if we do that. We need to start making peace with each other, figuring out how to live in harmony with each other, and talking about how we're going to overcome these challenges for humanity for the future, which are survival challenges. Don't you want a president who's thinking about those things? When I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his lifetime. Today, one out of every three children who walks through his office door is pre-diabetic or diabetic. Is that acceptable to you? Do you wonder why President Trump and President Biden have never mentioned that issue? Don't you think that that is about the most important issue that we can think about? The health of our children. This week is Autism Awareness Week. And today, when I was a kid in my generation, the incident of autism today in 70-year-old men is between 1 in 2,500, depending on what studies that you look at, 1 in 10,000. In my kids' generation, it's 1 in every 34 children, 1 in every 22 boys. It's causing our country, Mark Blaxel just published a peer-reviewed study that shows the cost is now a trillion dollars a year. And uh, do you think that's acceptable? No. Oh, you want a president who's gonna change that? Yeah. Uh, there are. There are a thousand ingredients in the food we eat in this country that are banned in Europe. Do you think we should be eating something that is illegal to eat in Europe? <laughs> Don't you want a president who's thinking about that? Don't you want a president who's going to put an end to that? Well. I, I am going to change those things when I get in the White House. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to end the war machine. I'm going to unravel this corrupt merger of state and corporate power. I'm going to get this, this generation of kids into homes of their own so that because we do not want to go from being an ownership society to being a rental society because we understand that that means that we're going to go from being citizens to being subjects and we need to preserve our democracy in this country and we need a food supply that's not poisoning us. And we need to protect our environment, Long Island Sound, our soils, our Purple Mountains majesty, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, the things that enrich in us, that, that, that connect us to creation, that connect us ultimately to God. And, And we need to restore our moral authority globally. And, and don't you want a president who's working on those things for you and who understands them? Don't you want that? I know that when I get into the White House, I can give you back your country. And I can give every American, Republicans and Democrats, Trump followers, Biden policy, when they see what I can do, 
they're going to have hope for this country again, and they're going to learn to live with each other and to love each other again, and that's what we need as a nation. I, I can't do it alone. I need, thank you. I, I need your help. Over the next three weeks, we need to get close to 100,000 signatures. So anything you can do, please get out there onto the barricades and let's win this election and let's win this back. Thank you so much. By the way, I want to get my picture taken with every one of you.